Um, thank you all for coming, and um, it's, I, I, uh, I need to thank n not only individuals but also an institution today, actually. Um, you know, thanks obviously to Mark for, for such a generous introduction. I <laughs> greatly appreciate it. Um, when I was in graduate school, I thought that I was interested in civil rights, and that's a domestic U.S. topic, right? I didn't think I needed the rest of the world. And it was the research, actually, that helped me make the connections, that helped me understand that I needed, that the world was part of U.S. civil rights history. And so, essentially, on my own, <laughs> without anyone showing me how to do it, I found my way into archives of the U.S. State Department, um, where there was so much on civil rights that at that point had not really been tapped. Um, and then I knew that I needed to go to the meeting where people had footnotes like mine. Uh, and so <coughs> I went with great trepidation to the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. And so, uh, you know, I want to thank both Mark as a colleague at Schaefer, but really the field. Um, and it's been one of those times when, you know, you sort of walk into somebody else's neighborhood and they actually were welcoming, and that's been central to facilitating my work. Um, uh, thank you also to Jessica Mahoney and to Bobby Chesney and, and everyone else associated with the Strauss Center and helping um, create this program. I actually have to thank the University of Texas as an institution. Um, Lynn Hunt wrote, wrote an essay once called How Writing Leads to Thinking and I completely agree with her that you know it's the writing where the ideas get worked out um, at Texas, it's also a place where talking leads to thinking. Um, and as I was writing the wartime book, I w went from an essay, I thought I was just going to write an essay, and then literally people ordered me to, especially Marilyn Young, you have to do what Marilyn says, ordered me to, ri ordered me to write a book. And as I was thinking about moving from essay to book, along the way, University of Texas had uh, a call for papers for a Cold War conference. And I thought, well, I've written about the Cold War. The Cold War should be in this book, but exactly how is it in this book? And it was simply thinking about the call for papers, literally, that helped me conceptualize what became my Cold War chapter and the central component of the, of the wartime book. And Bobby Chesney, meanwhile, invited me to speak at the law school. And those two talks were really so helpful to developing the ideas for that, that work. Um, so, t so, um, so thank you all. Now, today I'd like to talk about um, abstract, abstract context. I'm sorry, concepts uh, that do a lot of work in law, policy, and historiography, wartime and peacetime. Um, according to some accounts, we are on our way from one concept to another, from wartime to peacetime. Uh, this is Jay Johnson, now Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, before he stepped down as General Counsel to the Defense Department in late 2012, um, he gave a speech that was very widely covered. Um, he, Congress had authorized the use of military force against those nations, organizations, or persons involved in the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. Johnson explained, I do believe that on the present course there will come a tipping point, a tipping point at which so many of the leaders and operatives of Al-Qaeda and its affiliates have been killed or captured such that Al-Qaeda as we know it, as, as the organization our Congress authorized military force against, um, has been effectively dis de uh, destroyed. This could have far-reaching importance, uh, for he remarked, war must be regarded as finite extraordinary and unnatural state of affairs. Peace must be regarded as the norm uh, toward which the human race continually strives. President Obama has echoed this idea in speeches of his own. Johnson's speech was taken as a sign that a long war was ending or that an ending was finally at least imaginable. Under, under the conventional formulation, um, the end of war would be the moment uh, when an imagined pendulum would begin in swimming, swinging in a new direction, away from wartime and prioritization of security um, over rights. Peacetime and the normal <coughs> rule of law would return. 
Now, if a tipping point from wartime to peacetime was going to do this work, um, uh, uh, moving society in a new, new direction, away from prioritization of se security towards rights, um, then this is a pretty important moment, right? But it wasn't accompanied by a lot of pomp and circumstance. Uh, there were no ticker tape parades. There were no photos of soldiers kissing nurses in public squares. Um, but perhaps this has been because we had been here before. Excuse me. Um, and it may, it, uh, President George Bush told us that at least the Iraq part of it was uh, finished a long time ago before it was not. Um, and it may be a little hard to remember, but late in the summer of 2010, the conflict in Iraq ended again live on NBC. Uh, on August 18, 2010, NBC News anchor Brian Williams announced breathlessly, it's gone on longer than the Civil War, longer than World War II, and tonight U.S. combat troops have pulled out of Iraq. NBC reporters insisted that the moment was historic as soldiers drove across the border from Iraq into Kuwait. Now, the history-making quality of this episode needed a little bit of explaining because 50,000 American troops remained in Iraq fully armed and reports of American casualties in Iraq would continue. President Obama followed up with an address to the nation on August 31, 2010. Although he did not arrive on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier, uh, this was nevertheless the, the, this president's mission accomplished moment. He called the events historic and he praised American troops who had completed every mission they were given. Now, the nature of that mission seemed obscure and the president did not illuminate it, but once deployed, the personalization of American war support by the president and others meant that the nation could rally behind its soldiers without engaging the war's broader purpose and what it may have accomplished. With the pullout, Operation Iraqi Freedom was replaced with Operation New Dawn. Now, just how different the mission would be was clarified when practical questions quickly arose. Um, if combat was over, would American troops uh, no longer be eligible for hostile fire pay or combat service medals? Um, the Army responded with a message to all troops. The end of combat operations in Iraq was effective September 1. However, combat conditions are still prevalent. This is a quotation. Uh, due to the nature of combat conditions, wartime awards will be issued in theater until a date to be determined. Um, other combat benefits would still be available, too. Uh, Thomas Ricks wrote, it is unusual for the Army to come right out and say that the emperor has no clothes. However, it had to in this case because soldiers take medals seriously. Perhaps the paradoxical nature of this ending that was not an ending explains the absence in President Obama's speech of his usual rhetorical power. American troops, he said, are the steel of our ship of state. They give us confidence that our course is true. And so the mission had devolved to supporting the troops while the troops themselves gave the mission meaning. Uh, this circularity befitted what the president called an age without surrender ceremonies, an age when conflict could end even as it remained ongoing. Uh, now these episodes show how important it is to political leaders to have this kind of a moment to bring conflict to an end. Uh, for both of these presidents, Bush and Obama, um, as for so many previous presidents, war's character defied their political objectives and conflict kept, kept escaping the boundaries of discrete war times. Now, ambiguity about war and its boundaries are, of course, is of course nothing new. Uh, when Arthur D. Nicholson was shot in East Germany on March 24, 1985, the very meaning of his death was contested. Thought of as the last American Cold War casualty, Nicholson was on an intelligence gathering mission when he was shot by a Soviet sentry. Was he murdered, as President Ronald Reagan claimed? Was he a victim, uh, as is said on a commemorative plaque near the site of his death? 
though that this is not usually the term we apply to soldiers killed in battle. Did he die in a battle that we call the Cold War? Nicholson was laid to rest in Arlington National Cemetery beneath an ambiguous headstone. It reads, killed in East Germany, U.S. military liaison mission. No mention was made of who killed him or why he was shot, objected the for Veterans of Foreign, Affa uh, uh, Foreign Wars magazine. This is reflective of how many Americans who preceded Nicholson in death during the Cold War are remembered. Arthur Nicholson's body came to rest in a shifting terrain. Even as he bled to death in a field in East Germany, the historical category of his military service, the Cold War, was beginning to collapse. The nature of his death and its consequences depended on whether it fit within a period that we call a wartime. But if the soldier died in battle, it was not the sort of battle imagined by Clausewitz. Nicholson's weapon was a camera. He had no accompanying battalion. He was a liminal figure in an ambiguous era, and his death seemed to trigger a need to stabilize the categories. The Cold War's ambiguity is, of course, written to, into its very title and was predicted by George Orwell, who thought that the development of nuclear weapons would lead to a world divided between super states that would avoid large-scale wars at the cost of prolonging indefinitely a peace that will be no peace. Uh, the Cold War's ambiguity might have sing signaled that the conventional categories of wartime and peacetime had ceased to exist or had melted together. Arguments along these lines informed political discourse in the 1940s and 50s but the effort to put an ending onto contemporary conflicts shows us that the categories of wartime and peacetime persist. Peace is to belie believe to be something re real and attainable, a state we can get to, even though it appears that peace is a concept that lacks its own definition, most often described as a negation of something else, the absence of war. So the concept of wartime has been doing a lot of work uh, in American thought. And my book, Wartime, simply tries to take a look at this and think about it. On its face, wartime is a temporal concept. Um, and so my starting point is, is to examine the ideas about time that are built into the way we think about war. Uh, the reason this matters is that wartime is not simply a description of what is happening in an era, but can also be an argument in support of harsh policies. Why have we detained people without charges on, on Guantanamo? Because it's wartime, uh, and it is legitimate <coughs> to, uh, to detain the enemy during wartime, and harsh social policies are, are, are part of wartime, and don't worry about it. After wartime, it all goes away. Uh, in her book, uh, Measuring Time, Making History, uh, Lynn Hunt notes that during the French, French Re Revolution, Bertrand Barrer claimed that his era compelled his acts of repression. I did not shape my epoch, time of revolution and political storms, he argued. I only did what I had to do, obey it. He was obeying his time. Um, in the, the times or the era in, his, in this account compelled the action so that time modifies human agency. The idea that war times are exceptional moments determine, uh, enables this kind of determinism. Uh, the idea that one is driven or determined by t the times. And you know about the torture memos and, and John Yu's role, and he actually writes in a way that sort of, I think, uh, parallels this idea that time is driving um, the action. Uh, if time has this kind of power in history, or at least if temporality serves to excuse or excuse or be explain human behavior, then the nature and conception of wartime as a form of time demands critical attention. Um, so in this project, what I do is um, I work on three different arguments. Um, first, uh, I argue that an understanding of time is embedded in our thinking about war. Um, enabling policies that rest on wartime as an argument. Second, this conception of time affects the literature on the history of war's impact, both in history and in law and also in political science and elsewhere. Third, this understanding of war and time is in tension with the um, uh, history of American military engagement, which is not 
episodic but ongoing. Um, now, in scholarship on law and war, time is seen as linear and episodic. Um, we move from, there's two different kinds of time, we move from one time to another. Um, historical progression is sort of going from one time to another. Law is thought to vary depending on what time it is. Um, a central metaphor is a swinging pendulum, strong rights in peacetime, security in wartime. And so this makes it inevitable, right? After wartime is over, then we recalibrate. That's been part of Obama's recent rhetoric. That's why we want to tip from peace, war to peace, or the way he more describes it is, lately is um, a smaller wartime footprint. Um, but, but the idea is that there's something normal that we call peace, and we're trying to get back, back to that. Um, so this conceptualization is embedded in scholarship and law and legal history. It's written in judicial opinions. It's part of popular culture. There's even a Star Wars episode on the idea of, you know, uh, that law is silent during war. Um, after 9-11, there have been important revisionist efforts. But by and large, they aim for different ways of describing the era. Is it a war? Is it a crisis? Is it an emergency? Leaving the basic conceptual structure in place, normal times periodically ruptured by non-normal times and then restored. Um, now, why does this matter? Um, at, there's at least two different kinds of issues, one for policymakers. Uh, uh, time zones cause us to think that war-related policies are temporary. Um, second, uh, a historiography problem. Um, scholars sometimes, you know, the interwar years, right? We don't have to think about war because this is a not war period. Um, so we don't always look for impacts that are war related um, because it's conceptualized as outside those boundaries. Um, much, uh, much it, um, so, one reason that the temporal frame for war has so much power is that the outbreak of war is seen as breaking time, as ushering in a new era. Um, and so this is Felix Frankfurter who says after Pearl Harbor, although he, interestingly, because he was obsessed with World War II, you know, during the fall of France. It's, he didn't think that war was new, but still Pearl, Pearl Harbor meant for him that everything had changed and he was going to war. Um, but the onset of war is not seen as a discrete event, you know, a, a discrete catalytic moment, but the beginning of an era that has temporal boundaries on both sides. And that's what um, I'm trying to sort of take the catalytic moments out of the argument that it seems to automatically flow from that, that it's the opening of a time that has a, that, that we know um, will have an end. So to explore this problem, I literally turned to scholarship on time. Um, and, um, uh, and it was, it's spectacular. Um, so I started with Linda Greenhouse, um, who argues that we tend to think of our time as linear time and everybody else's time as cultural, right? Other people have the culture, and that's why they have secular, sic, circ, uh, cyclical versions of time. But our time is the real thing. Um, but Greenhouse argues that the way we think about time is also cultural. Um, and Emil Durkheim helps us to think about this. He says, we can't even think about how to think about time except in the categories into which we divide it. It seems insane to do it any other way, but of course, the concept of a second, you know, didn't emerge with the sort of creation of the universe, right? Um, so he says, where do these categories come from? What's the origin of the differentiation into which we divide time? Um, and the answer is not in nature, but in social life. Um, these categories of thought are born in social or collective experience. Um, for Greenhouse, drawing upon Durkheim, linear time is also social time. Uh, it's a set of understandings about time that come from shared cultural experience. Um, in recent scholarship, Thomas Allen argues uh, that social historians have demonstrated that changes in time consciousness can't be explained as a history of progress from more primitive to more uh, rational organizations of time. Um, instead, the 
hom homogeneity of time that supposedly results from things like watches um, is only possible if these technologies themselves produce time. Um, uh, so, by the way, Tom Allen, whose book is brilliant, um, and some other really interesting historians of time, and me, are going to do a panel, a roundtable, at the Organization of American Historians meeting. Um, so if you're going to the OAH in Atlanta, um, you know, his work is so spectacular, and, and I really um, recommend this panel. Um, so the work of Allen, Greenhouse, and others um, help us to see that, in Allen's words, Time is not a trans-historical phenomenon, an aspect of nature, a product of technology um, existing outside of human society, but is an historical artifact produced by human beings acting within specific historical circumstances. I think once we start thinking about it, that simply makes sense. Um, so just as our understanding of clock time comes from social life, the idea of wartime as it appears in American legal and political thought is an historical artifact. A, a, con, a, a historically contingent set of meanings that derive not from anything essential about war or about time. We need to view wartime, like linear time, as social time. Um, so one illustration of this um, came from the end of a circus in Cleveland, Ohio in, uh, um, in 1942. On the eve evening of February 8, 1942, Cleveland's mayor, Frank Lauschi, ceremoniously advanced two clocks, uh, turning Cleveland's time in, in sync with year-long daylight savings time, which was by statute called wartime. Uh, the mayor told the circus crowd uh, and broadcast over the radio that the change in time was gratifying because of the electricity it would save for war work. Around the country, time changed at 2 a.m. Um, standard time, uh, to, in compliance with a new federal law uh, establishing ongoing daylight savings time during the war. Now, farmers and others objected. Uh, standard time itself was a human construct, of course, uh, but many Americans, uh, it seemed as if it was natural or God-given, and they objected to giving it up. One Minnesota farmer complained, to delude oneself that it is six o'clock when the sun, moon, stars, and God in heaven have ordained that it is but five o'clock, I believe justifies the statement that the so-called daylight savings time probably stands at the head of the list of an example of complete asininity. This is in the congressional record. So. <laughs> um, uh, a representative of the National Grange objected on behalf of dairy farmers who would have to get up at three rather than four to milk their cows. They must work in harmony with natural law, or they work to no purpose at all, he insisted. But nature had not changed, only the name of the hour they had to rise. Now, why does all of this matter? Because law is thought to vary depending on what time one is in. Um, and uh, the idea that wartime is a, as, an, a, as an exceptional moment outside of regular politics can enable or justify extreme policies. So for this formulation to work, time must have temporal boundaries, right? Um, so let's look at 20th century American war times. And here's take one. And if we look at maybe the way American history books are structured, this might be your chapter structure. Um, could be my chapter structure. <laughs> uh, uh, th th this is a common, in the, and this is especially the, the sort of wars that matter in the U.S. civil liberties literature. Um, so how else might you look at it? Well, I wanted to find somebody else's database, right, uh, rather than come up with it myself. And I decided to look at a congressionally created database of American war. So here it is. Um, and uh, what I used is U.S. Military Campaign Service Medals. I actually edited this a little bit for the book, but this is the, um, it, uh, you know, what we've got is, uh, campaign service medals were created in 1906. Uh, the person who pushed this legislation through Congress was the U.S. Uh, commander of American troops during the Boxer Rebellion in China, uh, not uh, one of the wars that was on the earlier slide, right? And, uh, and for these medals, you get them simply for honorably serving in a particular conflict. 
Um, and so, uh, and if you look at other databases, for example, I looked at membership rules for U.S. veterans organizations, and the veterans of foreign wars, if I did a timeline for them, it would look kind of like this. Um, so, um, before we got to this slide, if you know American history, of course, you already know, if you know history of anything, you already know there's a lot more war that the U.S. was involved in other than those conflicts that are often structuring our chapters. Um, so, um, uh, but you know when World War II started and ended, right? There's some wars that matter, and maybe we're just looking at the wars that matter, uh, and those wars have finite time boundaries. Um, so, um, let's look at, um, the, there was a murder case on a U.S. Army base in California and in Lee versus Madigan, the defendant's life, at least initially, he and it sentence commuted, but uh, the defendant's life depended upon when World War II ended, requiring the U.S. Supreme Court to rule on whether the World War II was over by 1949. Uh, John Lee, a prisoner in the U U.S. Uh, Army disciplinary barracks at Camp Cook in California, and three others were kill accused of killing another inmate. Um, they were convicted following a court-martial and sentenced to death. Um, the difficulty in the case was that Article 92 of the Laws of War provided that no person shall be tried by court-martial for murder or rape within the geographic limits of the States of the Union and the District of Columbia in time of peace. So Lee brought a habeas corpus challenge, arguing that the date of the crime, June 10, 1949, was a time of peace depriving the court martial of, of, of jurisdiction. So the case literally turned on when did World War II end. So what are the possibilities? Um, declaration of peace with Japan wasn't until 1952. Um, okay, so if you wanted to argue that war was going on, um, we don't even have the cessation of hostilities generally in World War II until uh, December 1946. Um, now, the various endings to World War II left the court in something of a muddle. The prosecution argued that the nation was not in time of peace for the purpose of Article 92 uh, because that provision had not yet been repealed. So under this argument, what ends World War, World War II? Congress uh, um, rescinding the applicability of Article 92. Right, so the ending of a war would come not from an armistice being signed, but from Congress repealing a particular subsection. Um, in, early, in an earlier case, Ludica versus Watkins, the court held that ending a state of war was a political act, and courts must defer to the judgment of other branches. Um, in Woods versus Cloyd Miller, the court upheld a rent control statute as an appropriate exercise of Congress's war-related powers, even though it was passed in 1947 um, and addressed a, um, a post-45 housing crisis. The court found that the war power did not necessarily end with the cessation of hostilities, but includes the power to remedy evils from, uh, from which, which have arisen from its rise and progress and continues for the duration of that emergency. Prohibition laws were upheld after World War I under a similar rationale. So these cases, though, didn't drive Douglass's analysis in Madigan. Um, he said, Congress in drafting laws may, be, may decide that the nation is at war for some purposes and at peace for another, and the court's job was to de determine whether in the sense of this law peace had arrived. Uh, concerned that Madigan w uh, was a death penalty case, so the stakes were higher, Douglas essentially gave Article II his common sense reading, holding that the date of the crime was a time of peace as those words were used in the article. So you can imagine basically war and peace coexisting depending on which subsection of which statute or, or regulation you're looking at. Um, so this example illustrates that even for World War, for even for 20th century's most iconic war, uh, there is an uneasy and uncertain relationship between wartime and war power. War provides the occasion for the use of war powers, but it's hard to contain them within tidy time boundaries. Um, just as wartime does a lot of work in law and policy, uh, politics, the concept is also important to historians. Wartimes structure histories, providing chapter divisions, but wartime does more than that. It is an 
agent in history, an abstract historical actor driving the narrative. Um, war times are thought of as essentially having a start and a finish and then causality in between. Um, war times seems to be such an obvious source of social change that its existence is evidence enough of causality. Um, to see why this can lead to trouble, let me just briefly um, talk about the, the, a difficulty in the area of the Cold War and civil liberties. And I'm not going to talk about how the civil rights um, uh, literature fits in, but I'm happy to do that later. Um, so um, civil, you, you know the story about civil liberties um, uh, being suppressed in the United States um, during the um, years 19, after 1945, right? The red baiting, the Hollywood Ten, um, the blacklist, etc. Um, now, um, civil liberties were under assault, but is this due to the Cold War? If we think of the Cold War as a geopolitical event, like what you know, what's the relationship between the war stuff, the geopolitics, and what's happening at home? Um, and Vet veterans groups for their membership criteria, diplomatic historians tend to periodize uh, the Cold War one way. And if you're doing your Civil Liberties Cold War chapter, you basically have a completely different periodization. Um, and so how does this work? If um, Civil Liberties is being affected by geopolitics as opposed to something else, um, then the civil liberty story would seem to track the geopolitical story, but it doesn't work, does it? Right? Yates versus United States, when the court, the Supreme Court steps back from the uh, its um, it, its jurisprudence from Dennis versus United States, the anti-communist case, and it makes it harder to prosecute someone for being a communist. And this is taken by some folks as being the point when essentially the Cold War is ending in terms of its impact on civil liberties. Um, and, but it's not a point when the, there's a downturn in geopolitical tension. Um, so if the civil liberties are being driven by geopolitics, how come the timelines are so off? Um, well, Thomas Emerson, writing in the 1950s, an iconic First Amendment scholar, made a different argument uh, than we sometimes see in the contemporary literature. Um, it was not Cold War national security itself that affected rights, he argued. Uh, it was domestic anti-communism, which had its source in the domestic politics of the era, produced in part by external events, um, but, uh, uh, but then essentially running on its own timeline, so that international affairs becomes a rhetoric of a domestic political phenomenon. Um, uh, Ellen Schrecker, whose work, of course, is so important in the area of McCarthyism, also in her preface um, uh, discussing methodology, I think tracks Emerson. Um, and Craig and Logeville, their book, America's Cold War, I think is especially helpful on helping us to see how the Cold War becomes a feature of American political discourse that is running on its own terms and is not necessarily tied to or driven by geopolitics. So if we're thinking about war as being having a start and an ending with the causality in between, the Cold War actually doesn't fit that. There's a relationship between geopolitics and the domestic events, but it's much more complicated. And sometimes the domestic story is driven on its, uh, on its own. Um, and this idea, uh, for me, it's been so helpful to look at newer scholarship in public opinion uh, by political scientists. Um, so Adam Berinsky argues that war and crisis in the abstract are not what affect American public opinion, at least in a sustained way over time. Catalytic events can generate a particular public reaction, but then the way the public reacts to or understands war is determined by um, not the geopolitical events themselves, but by elite discourse and partisan politics. People learn about the geopolitics from sources that they turn to. Those sources are framing the debate, um, and, and, uh, and, and 
And so there's a, there's a step between the geopolitics and the domestic reaction. Um, so we can't just take on its face war equals impact, right? We can't let the concept of war do the causality. We have to look at what else is happening and what the domestic um, components are of a reaction to a set of geopolitical events. Um, uh, this helps us to see that um, we need to examine not only war and the domestic reaction, but also the filter between the two, the construction of narratives of war, sometimes in partisan ways. And by the way, Susan Brewer's book, um, Why America Fights, I think is so helpful on this. Um, international affairs, including war, affect domestic pol uh, rights in historically specific and concrete ways. Different rights map onto different timelines, some geopolitical, some domestic, and international affairs can be a rhetoric of what is, in essence, an era of domestic politics. Um, so the Cold War effect on rights was not because it was a warlike era with a start, a finish, and repression in the middle. Um, something more is needed to understand rights in the post-World War II era. The concept of wartime by itself can't do the work. Um, so what can be said of our latest wartime? Uh, it may reveal another impact of the perpetuation of outmoded categories. Once a catalytic moment like 9-11 is, is conceptualized as the opening of an era that necessarily has an end, we persist in assuming its temporary character at least until we stop thinking about it. Um, this affects much more than our toleration for rights restriction in wartime. War's temporariness has become uh, a justification for presidential unilateralism. And you know this story, of course. The dust had not settled in lower Manhattan before features of the post-9-11 era began to emerge. As the events of September 11th unfolded, among the shock and horror, was a discomforting narrative ambiguity. What was this? What was happening? How do I understand this? But from the beginning, whether it was a war, whether it was something else, September 11th was seen as the day that changed everything. Conflict had broken time, had severed historical continuity, had opened a new era. Americans proceeded to impose traditional categories on an unruly present, uh, especially the idea of wartime. So these frames from the past essentially helped us make sense of a new, confusing, and disturbing reality. Uh, if the war on terror lacked the boundaries of traditional war times, the justification for new policies from domestic surveillance to detention at Guantanamo to waterboarding was nevertheless that it was wartime, as if time itself compelled extreme policies. Now, if the president seemed to draw upon this narrative to rally public support for the administration's response to the attacks, he was not alone. Uh, a war narrative was reinforced in American popular culture. Scholars debated whether the era was wartime, but most responded to the era's ambiguity not by jettisoning the categories, but by renaming and reimposing them. And there was one prominent article about wartime's impact on courts. The draft was renamed Crisis Impact on Courts uh, and went right back into the production process really without the, you know, so, so the, basically this happened all over the place. War, crisis time or something else became the language, but the basic conceptual structure remained the same. Um, what, whatever we called it, it wasn't normal time. Uh, legal scholars turned to Carl Schmidt. Um, and, and this is attracting simply folks who used Schmidt for the purpose of invoking that quote, the sovereign is he who declares the exception. The, I tried to take out of this uh, any substantive engagement with a broader range of Schmidt's ideas. Um, there were panels at conferences, not just the law school world, but American Political Science Association um, on Schmidt. Consistent across this literature was the idea that time had changed that September 11th had ushered in a new era, um, the state of exception, and that's how we needed to think about it. And we seemed for so long largely stuck in an analysis that made abuses of executive power seem inevitable. And my central concern about the exceptionality discourse is simply that it's over-determinative. 
Uh, not only does it suggest that ever-expanding executive power will always flow from wars and crises, that it's inevitable, that there is no possibility of a break, it also excuses the rest of us from the political work that might generate more effective restraints. Um, political philosopher John Brenkman, I think, provides, and I wish this work was more widely read, uh, provides a way out um, with his book on political thought since September 11th. Um, Brenkman argues that Schmidt's formulation of the sovereign as he who declares the exception obscures the little wedge created by the distinction uh, uh, bet, bet, and hence the political gap between declaration and claim, act and justification, rule and legitimacy. Um, it is here, along these hairline fractures in the discourse of power, that Brenkman finds the very possibility of political realm and of democracy. Um, so that, you know, moment when, when George Bush essentially went to the American public and he had to be able to generate a sense of legitimacy for his position. He didn't just articulate it as a war, but he had to be articulated in a way that was convincing, right? And that's the place where there's a political gap, an era, a, a jump, um, a moment of politics. So where does this hairline fracture appear in legal thought? and how is it managed. Legal scholars writing about the post-9-11 era, like those engaging the Cold War and other conflicts, tend to take external events uh, that generate crises like war as a given. The crises appear to exist out in the world, outside the realm of law, and it is the legal scholar's task to take up the way those external events mm -hmm. affect law's functioning. The crisis exists and law reacts until the crisis goes away. Um, but the facts of war do not speak for themselves. Uh, we need to interrogate the way military conflict is conceptualized and the way this conceptualization, not simply the bombers and the missiles and the drones, right? Uh, the way the conceptualization of the era of war affects American thinking about war. Uh, following Brinkman, the exception, the idea that we are in an, an exceptional era during which the rules will be different derives not only from something external, uh, but from the, the wedge between declaration and claim, act and justification. The need for legitimacy puts the possibility of politics in the middle of identifying the state of exception. Uh, the crisis or war isn't external to the, to the world of politics that law occupies. Instead, exceptionality derives from something that is internal and political the framing or articulation of crisis and its justification. So along that hairline fracture in that political space lies the construction of the idea of wartime. It is there that the narrative work is done, framing an episode as a war and placing it in the legacy of great American conflicts. For all the challenges of George W. Bush's presidency, he succeeded completely in this fundamental task, rallying the nation behind the idea that we were at war. Now, the greatest challenge to the idea that war is exceptional is, of course, the facts on the ground. If, if the war on terror was a rupture of normal time, then it was inherently ter temporary and would last only until normal times returned. And so we get back to the idea that Jay Johnson articulated at our starting point, that we are tipping from, peace t from wartime to peacetime. Uh, but par perhaps we are instead tipping into a form of warfare that largely escapes our attention. Um, now, at this point, I would sort of close by sort of going off on how we have to think politically about the idea of wartime, but, uh, but there's really a little bit more work to do, and so if you can be patient with me for a moment. Um, uh, because I've come to realize that there's another step we have to take. We have to understand how how the, how the concepts of war and peace continue to exist in an era of ongoing conflict. Um, and in order to do that, we have to think about time and space together. Now, there is um, obviously an especially important way that space matters to American war. Um, American war is an expert, export. Our force is exerted outside of U.S. territory. But space also matters for the politics of American war for the domestic tolerance of U.S. government practices. And we need to, uh, a way to take into account the fact that wartime and peacetime 
are the lived experiences of many Americans, those engaged in the work of American war, soldiers, reservists, military contractors, their families and their communities, have direct experience of wartime, while the rest of us can go about our daily lives mil mi minimally affected by American military conflict. Just one example, at Macy's in Manhattan and at the Mall of America in Minnesota looks pretty much like a peacetime, uh, but not so in Fort Bragg, North Car uh, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, the home of Fort Bragg. Uh, planes fly within 1,500 feet of homes uh, near an Air Force runway. Pictures on walls and even tombstones in the cemetery are continually restraightened after they are shaken by the impact of artillery rounds. Even for an everyday civilian uh, in Fayetteville, someone without a spouse or child in the military or reserves, war's constancy cannot be avoided. Fayetteville doesn't seek to avoid it. As, as Catherine Lutz has written, uh, war is the city's leading industry. It drives Fayetteville's economy. This helps us to see, and there's so much more that, that we could talk about here, who it is that ends up serving, uh, how that service is concentrated in terms of class especially, or the service of particular families who have done it for generations. Um, but this helps us to see that whether it is wartime or peacetime within the United States uh, depends not on what time it is, but on uh, who you are and where you live. So we might think of peace as not a time but a place as a spatial concept. Space, like time, is not fixed. It is experienced culturally. Durkheim talks about this too. We make meaning of particular places. We make the meaning of particular places. Um, it is because peace is experienced geographically rather than temporally that much of the U.S. population can truly feel that they are experiencing peace, while war's violence is the province of its soldiers, their families, and those who reside in the places of its export. Concepts of time and space matter tremendously to the way we write about war. But they also have, I think, an, import, an impact on the essential problem of war and democratic accountability. The most important limits on American war and security policies come not from the courts, right, obviously, but from the engaged, engagement of the American people. There's only meaningful pushback from Congress when voters think it is a priority. This happened in the later years of the war in Vietnam. How will political restraints on the war power work in the 20th century? Uh, there have been occasional upticks in public engagement, but the American people seem to be more concerned about matters that affect them personally. Is someone looking at my Facebook page? When I went to, you know, Angry Birds, did the NSA steal all my data, right? Ra so that's where the focus lately has been, rather than, for example, the use of force in targeted killing. As, Americans, um, as American war becomes more automated and the military relies on outsourcing, fewer and fewer American families have personal ties to military service. Um, U.S. military power extends geographically, and this is an image of drone bases in Africa, uh, but political engagement with the use of force seems to be shrinking. Um, this, effect, the, this affects the time and space of American war politics. During our current war era, members of Congress uh, will campaign in peacetime districts. The more American war experience is concentrated and isolated, the experience of war by everyday <laughs> Americans, concentrated and isolated, the smaller the constituency for a political agenda related to war. Um, mem members of Congress aren't going to make it a priority when the voters put it way down the list of anything they have any interest in. Uh, much attention is being paid to the way secrecy affects the political accountability of national security policy, but there is a problem of equal and enduring importance. How exactly is democracy in the form of political restraints in the, on the war power going to work when war's experience is isolated, when, the, when peacetime is the dominant experience? Of, this, of citizens engaged, uh, citizens of a nation engaged in ongoing war. Thank you. Thank you so much, and plenty of time for questions, discussion. Um, do you want? To, would you sort of call on hands, or do you want to talk? Um, what do you want to call people? Oh, sure. you'll, you'll probably hey. see them better. Um, 
please just introduce yourself very quickly um, so we all know who you are. Please. Yes, uh, interesting, and a lot of questions, but one uh, struck me as you were identifying the President Bush's call for war on terror. We've seen a backlash to that concept as we've begun to understand asymmetrical warfare and, uh, and state sponsors of this kind of asymmetrical warfare. So it seems to me it's also a concomitant responsibility to identify what these sources or threats are in a very specific way as opposed to the use of a general category to invoke uh, the kinds of responses. Could you introduce yourself really quickly? Oh. Um, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I, as you were th talking, I was thinking, well, actually, we've been doing asymmetrical war for a while, right? Because we, the U.S. engaged in asymmetrical war against the Philippine independence movement, you know, early in the 20th century. So, you know, with, with the issue of asymmetric war, yes, that's part of the, um, you know, the current war paradigm. Um, but but it's it's not something new. So if, if I understand your question, is it that it, there, it's it's, ambigu it's ambigu ambiguous? You know who the object of war is. Yeah, and and we can further, I think, by being more specific, even though that's a temporal event to begin to understand it, we then as lawyers can uh, reduce the parameters for which uh, the kind of. I see. That's absolutely right. And one of the difficulties with, um, I think this is discussed in Bobby Chesney, who knows with this better than me, but the, the, um, the, uh, the discussion about problems with the original post-9-11 authorization for the use of military force <coughs> and the way it's been interpreted, right? Because if, the, if, if it's against, you know, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates and people sort of who supported the attacks on September 11th, it, it's this amorphous group uh, that then, you know, is, is what about al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? Which groups are involved in it? And so if it's, you know, initially as, as President Bush articulated it as a war on terrorism, you know, there are terrorist groups all over the world. There have been for all time. And so on some level that's a recipe for endless war. President Obama has essentially participated in a similar version of that. He came into office, he campaigned on the idea initially that we, he would say, we are into wars. So at least it was confined to two geographic spaces, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and then along the way, he changed the rhetoric um, and, uh, and, and essentially used a different articulation of a war on terrorism. Uh, you know, he, he framed it in terms of al-Qaeda, um, but it wasn't identified as a particular group, you know, that had its, you know, roots in this conflict in Afghanistan. So you're absolutely right that, that one of the difficulties in how war is now framed is ambiguity around who the, you know, the enemy is. Um, and that then, what, what it does from my perspective that's problematic is it puts it all in the president's hands, right? That the president is the one who is able to determine what's the what's the nature, what's the extent of that group and when have we you know dealt with that problem um, and in a democracy the president should be uh, subject to political restraints um, and one of the ways that works is you know yes it's Congress but Congress is only engaged and powerful on issues of war and peace when the American people are asking them to do it. So the, the more it's sort of ambiguous and amorphous, it simply reinforces um, presidential unilateralism. Bobby, uh, Bobby Chesney, Mary, thank you for being here. I, I just noticed the fun in the last slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful <laughs> notes. That's, that's on, uh, I'll be brief. So one of the things I think is so interesting about your work, it, it made me concentrate on the fact that the, the political utility of, of invoking the war frame, the wartime frame, in a way has, has begun to flip as, as a result of the amount of friction that the war model generated over the past 12 years. And, and I think this is consistent with what you're saying. Here's what I mean. Um, it traditionally would be the case that a president would want to invoke this model in order to enhance his own powers and to enhance the powers of the state to do things like 
sleep or force retention, etc. Um, the friction associated with maintaining the war claims have become significant to the point where, as you point out, the president, President Obama wanted to declare that we have exited Iraq. There were still our forces there. We're in the midst of a similar moment with Afghanistan. We are withdrawing, we're, we're shrinking our force there. And even if we, if it works out the way the administration wants it to, he'll be able to say the war in Afghanistan is over, but there is a residual force still present on the ground to conduct counterterrorism operations. The same thing's happening more broadly with respect to the third conflict, the US Al-Qaeda writ large conflict, right? That as Jay Johnson's speech went on, went on to talk about, if we do enter a post-war uh, phase with Al-Qaeda, that doesn't mean the military will have no role. There will still be the traditional, as he put it, lingering role for the military to be used to address continuing and imminent threats. And so what's going on here is suddenly having the wartime frame is actually disadvantageous politically and diplomatically, both international politics and domestic politics. You'd stick with it if you're the president, if you still needed that frame in order to have the, the powers you wanted to be able to exercise. What's really interesting is you don't really need the war frame these days anymore, thanks to the way the technological progress has expanded what you can do under authorities of national self-defense that didn't traditionally require you to also claim there's a war. And, and here the linchpin is the idea that if you're willing to claim that there's a threat that's, that's imminent and, and, and it poses a threat to American lives and that threat is imminent, you can still use force even without war. That's, that's the baseline legal model that's being invoked. And what's, what's key to understand there is that there too time is being disrupted because all of us here imminent, we think temporal imminence, strict temporal imminence. It's not what they mean. Famously, in any number of contexts, the administration has made clear in recent years that by imminence, they mean continuing threat. And it may not be strictly imminent in any real sense. So I wonder if you could just comment on whether you also see a flipping of why the wartime framework matters and if you see that uh, perhaps it doesn't matter anymore. Well, uh, let me sort of talk about it in a slightly different way. But this is, of course, really interesting and important. And, um, and uh, for graduate students interested in the current sort of CIA, Department of Defense relationship in ongoing military conflict and understanding how we think about that and how it maps onto American law, there's no better person to talk to than, for anyone to talk to anywhere than, than Bobby Chesney. So, you know, th this is an issue of tremendous importance. And, um, and, and one thing that's sort of underlying his comment is, if it's an imminent threat, then that becomes the justification for CIA drone strikes, you know, as opposed to Department of Defense military drone strikes. Those are under a law of armed conflict model. So what, one of the things that, that I think this does, you know, it, basically the, the idea of ongoing war, so the wartime model, I mean, Obama said he was coming into office to move us out of war. Obama got a Nobel Peace Prize, right? Obama, one of the things he's clearly interested in is his post-presidency, you know, trajectory. Um, and also, how does this presidency end up looking? You know, historians, <coughs> I actually said to someone in the administration, we actually have the last word. You know, we do have the last word, and I also said, right now it's not looking so good. Um, but <laughs> because of the war stuff, um, but that's my opinion. Um, so, and many historians will write differently. Um, so, essentially, uh, what, the way I look at it is um, there's both thinking within the administration, and probably Obama's thinking it himself, and probably he wants it to be peace you know, for policy reasons as well as all sorts of other reasons, including legacy reasons. But um, so, so what do you do when you also think that you want to continue to use, let me not say military force, let me say force using American personnel and big weapons. Um, so how do you accomplish both, get us to peace, and continue to have the use of this weaponry to get rid of people who you think are bad guys who want to hurt the United States of America um, and our allies. So essentially you use a different rationale for engaging in the same activity, right? So, so politically there's a huge value. I can't speak to operationally, 
right? Because on some level, I just don't know that stuff. Does it operational? I mean, and then you've got, you know, uh, uh, special forces operations where you've got a, you know, you've got CIA and military folks together. So all of our legal models are complicated by that. But but I can say as a matter of sort of the politics of it all. Um, even though I think we have profoundly anemic war politics in terms of the American people being engaged, um, if there's not a war, then you have no reason for any, right? And so moving away from a war model to a self-defense model um, means that there's not war, means that there's not a justification for you know, Congress to place restraints on American military action, and also as a matter of constitutional law, we don't have a declaration clause problem, right? Under the, under the Constitution, the Congress's power to declare war essentially comes to stand in for the, the concept of, of meaningful interbranch deliberation on matters of the commi committing of American force. If you're talking about self-defense, that's part of the executive branch's powers. So I think politically, um, it's tremendously useful. Uh, I also think in terms of the, the, the sort of character of American democracy and the future of our system of government actually working, um, it's terribly problematic and, um, and unfortunate. I, I don't see how we're going to move in a different direction without some meaningful um, political engagement with these very questions. One of the things I didn't ask you at the time, this was in, uh, in the spring of 2008, was um, that occurs to me um, in a kind of urgent way now is why um, privilege the concept of time to understand um, this, uh, you know, the overflowing uh, of war into peace, the ambiguities of the peace by states and so forth in a very instrumental way. Um, why, is, why is time important to understanding that? And I'm thinking, um, you know, time has been um, theorized about really uh, uh, Rich sort of ways with relationship to revolution. Um, you know, Lynn has, I think, really, she, she was in some of this work, um, probably a, a better known um, body of scholarship comes out of Walter Benjamin's thinking on uh, the idea, in particular, of empty homogenous time, sort of bourgeois capitalist construction of uh, uh, sort of everyday time, but with a specific um, uh, Mar Marxist inflection, time as, um, uh, as presenting itself as universal, as a commodity, and so forth. Um, way he saw in the early 20th century. But what he was looking for was, uh, you know, what he privileged was, was revolutionary time or messianic time, uh, the time when um, revolutionaries fire on clock towers, for example. Um, but, you know, so, so within revolutions, you know, you get the sort of zero hours of revolution. But within war itself, um, you know, I don't think so much work has, has been done on that. So this is why I think this is really uh, pathway to, uh, you know, to, to, to take this um, um, on in, um, in this book. And also, it's, it's interesting for me also, you know, I, I sort of see you as a, as a legal scholar. And I guess, you know, so the historian legal scholars work in legal concepts and terms and, um, and things like names, for example. You know, the, the naming, you know, is, is, is this a war? Can we call this a war through, through language? Um, and rather, uh, you know, you're taking kind of this, this angle from, um, from temporality. So I wonder if you could just uh, sort of um, 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 offer a few words on you know why time is essential to this over over um, um, different forms of uh, um, um, uh, not really language but con uh, concepts for example you might find a legal text for example yeah and Ben it's so fabulous to see you and I have to thank you for I uh, Ben was my colleague at the Institute for Advanced Study and that's when I was kind of like wandering around trying to figure out what was bothering me <laughs> And a lot of times I write something because, I was just talking at lunch, be because I'm confused <laughs> and I have to figure it out and I just can't, I mean, and literally that's how Cold War Civil Rights happened. I, 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 I kept wondering, why was Brown decided in the McCarthy era, for heaven's sakes? And one thing led to another. So, um, so you know, and Ben, talking to you back in those days when I wrote the first paper, and present it for the first time was which was tremendously helpful because not everybody thought it was a great idea <laughs> to do this. Um, so I can only talk about you know how it is I ended up here. 
And that's that I was thinking about moving from the book I was finishing about Thurgood Marshall's work in Africa, you know, to something uh, completely different, which is, which I'm still, now I'm supposed to be doing. Um, my editor watching this, I'm doing right now <laughs> as we speak, you know, a big uh, book on, uh, on, on uh, it's now focused on the issue of war and political engagement, um, not a sort of simple look at presidential war power, but sort of setting presidential war power in the context of a sort of a broader set of forces and developments um, in American history and American politics. How, how do we get to a point where there's no meaningful pushback on presidential war power? Um, so I was starting to think my way into this next project, and I just frankly got stuck because I kept going to meetings and people would say things like, so how does our wartime compare with other wartimes? And I wanted to say, that sounds completely insane. Um, <laughs> What, you know, it, I mean, it was sort of treating war as if it was a data set. Um, and the, what we do in our work is to look at these different data sets and compare them, what are the variables that make them different. And I, you know, this was not, um, you know, uh, this, the, 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 the calling the era something that has some sort of comparison with other data sets, I, I just had trouble getting my head around even the question. And um, I little by, I s just started asking myself, what, you know, what's bothering me? You know, wh what's, what is it about the question that seems to me so off kilter? Um, and I started looking at definitions, and this fabulous uh, librarian at the Institute for Advanced Study helped me run down places where wartime was defined. Um, and so I, it's not that I looked across concepts and decided that's the most powerful concept to understand American war. It's that the concept was driving me crazy, and I had to think my way through it. And so I just tried to write an essay and then I started workshopping the essay. And remember how talking leads to thinking? Um, it was more than anything else I've ever done. It was having lots of opportunities, thankfully, to talk about it, that I, I kept working on how wartime as a concept does important work in American law and politics, American history. And, and, it, and, and it sort of built from there. Um, and, you know, on, on the, the question, of more, this is more for sort of graduate students, the sort of career thing, you know, I'm in a field, I'm a legal historian, shouldn't I be doing something, you know, historians often think that legal historians are too boring. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I have, I, what drives me is not, you know, what are the rules of my field? Um, instead, it's really what makes me wake up in the middle of the night and I can't figure it out and I have to get to the bottom of it. And, 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 and obviously there's something more there, because there are a lot of things can bother you and you don't necessarily have to go write a book about it. But, um, but you know, I, I wanted to write about war in a meaningful way. I thought this was needed and I, um, I felt I had to figure out what this concept was doing in our thinking before I could write anything else. So that's all. Yeah. 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 Um, th and this is the next book. Um, so there are structural. It's not just why doesn't Congress do its job and restrain presidential war power. And on some level, the, there's some wonderful new books, but traditionally the war powers literature has been, I think, sort of running through the same question over and over with people taking different positions. But, but I think what we have to do is look at um, structural changes to the state, changes in the way the United States goes to war, um, changes in military forces, um, changes in technology. And we have to look at all of this over time. Um, and so, you know, your point is essentially Vietnam and after, uh, you know, important structural shift uh, before that.
is the creation of the national security state, you know, 1947 and after, um, and, and the sort of institutionalization of CIA and covert war, et cetera. So that's a piece of it. But after Vietnam, um, three things happen. Uh, one is all volunteer forces. And, and what that does is it puts us on this trajectory, not by itself, but it's an important component of this, uh, that the Pew Report, Pew, a Pew um, report recently discussed the fact that the younger you are as an American, the fewer family members you have who've served in the military. So folks, baby boomers like me, you know, my father was drafted, served in World War II. Uh, other, other folks, their parents were, you know, drafted, served in Korea or, or, or elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and further we get away from a draft, the, the fewer folks who have personal family members who have served and the, the smaller base of Americans who are voters who cycle through the military. Um, but there's also the importance of outsourcing, um, which, you know, uh, I'm not sure that my numbers are right anymore, but, um, but it was one troop to one, according to, um, to one book on this, <coughs> one troop to one contractor in Vietnam, and then um, at one point it was 1 to 17 post 9-11, and it's way higher than that now, right? And so you can basically do more in the footprint uh, rhetoric. You can have a greater military footprint with fewer members of the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, and they don't even have to be Americans, right? You can hire local folks to drive the trucks and make the soup. Um, so you've got, um, you've got those two factors, and then there's technology. And technology matters way before we get to drones. Um, and the, the important story about technology is the first Gulf War, which was commentators write about it as the first war where the heroes were the machines. Uh, and General Schwar Schwarzkopf and others in, in, uh, basically talked about the, um, the technology and how the technology had enabled you know, a quick, fast, successful war. Um, and war, and it was the smart bomb technology. And so war looked to Americans, at least initially, as precise, as targeted, without a lot of quote unquote collateral damage. We also have to talk about how that concept comes into existence. Um, and, um, and, so you, and, and so those developments are really important in terms of isolating everyday Americans from the experience of war. Okay, both not themselves being involved, family members not being involved, um, and then even their essentially consuming war news is in some ways sanitized by um, the, uh, the way technology affects the narrative of war. Distancing the American people from the experience and costs of war, taking it off the radar screen, making it easier to switch to the reality TV show instead of the news coverage. I would say we have time for uh, one more question, and then if I can speak for you, I think you offered to hang out a oh, little bit sure. after if there are uh, lingering questions um, that anyone would like to pursue. But uh, Carl, for our Carl last question. Carl Foster, Christian Education Institute History Department. Have you thought at all about um, the views of times taken by American adversaries in war, particularly about the Chinese view of time, and the effect that a potential asymmetry Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, and I don't have a good answer to it other than to say I did um, really look for, um, at one point, for again, to, for a conference on Guantanamo, I looked for descriptions of the experience of time on Guantanamo. And, and this isn't answering your question, but what's interesting there is the way that, that, that the even knowledge about time was managed by the, the guards. Right, so that even whether it's prayer time, you know, they put the cone out so that you can't even see where the sun is. Um, so, so there, there are interesting stories about time, about power over time, about different conceptions of time, you know, all, all over the place. And um, I would um, be really interested in a, you know, conceptions of time by other people in other places. Um, but I, um, I don't. I don't have a sense of sort of comparative Middle Eastern conceptions of time. Um, now, 
uh, because I'm interested in American uh, war politics and what's driving and what's restraining and what's complicating American war politics. For that, a sort of a U.S. Uh, use of time thinking in American discourse, that's sort of why I'm doing that. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure that I would think, it would be interesting to think about whether competing time con uh, consciousnesses, um, I mean, it clearly would affect relations between different groups, um, whether it would affect um, I mean, I think implicitly I'm hearing in your question, could this be an issue in terms of how it would affect conflicts across time? You know, I wonder whether someone like Ben works on Algeria, you know, might have sort of a take on, on questions like that. But, but I guess in this sort of getting out of the question, but for the question, that for what I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I'm not sure it would be helpful, even though I do think it, it's an important question. And the question of time in a way, that strategy I don't really have any. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there is a book on war and time by um, uh, Wells, Civil War Time. Um, and so there she gets into how even time pieces and their availability and sort of think, essentially screw up strategy in the context of the Civil War. When you think that an attack is going to happen at a certain time, but people can't coordinate <laughs> their understanding of when that time comes about. Um, so maybe that would underscore your point that time thinking could even matter in terms of how, you know, military conflicts play out. Um, strikes me as, as an interesting um, question to, to look at. I suppose that point has been made occasionally in connection with the Vietnam War. I live in a Vietnam-centric world. Everything's connected yeah. to Vietnam, but um, the different conceptions of time on the Vietnamese side, the revolutionary side versus the American side. So this goes back to Ben's point also. Yeah. yeah. Um, but listen, this, this has been fantastic. And I know there are many more um, questions out there. Let me just say a quick um, thanks to Andrew and <coughs> Jessica and Bobby. Thank you so much for supporting and making all this happen. And um, thanks to all of you for coming. And most importantly, thank you so much, Mary. This was thanks. fantastic. Thank you.